Good morning, folks. We'll just we'll get started in just one second. Well, hello everyone. Hello again, I should say. Thank you so much for attending yet another Levine Electronics and Electric webinar. Uh, Levine Electronics is a manufacturer's rep firm. We carry uh, transformers, switchgear, lines. Uh, we have a controls division as well as a power division. Uh, I spend most of my time on the power division, and uh, in case I didn't already state it, my name is Michael McClellan, I'm one of the partners at Levine Electronics and Electric. We, our philosophy at Levine is to um, give back to the community and to share information free of charge and to build a community of engineers. And we do feel that we are the experts in uh, several of these fields, including transformers and especially protection and control, uh, especially medium voltage switch gear. So um, a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, this is a webinar uh, and today we are in standard format. So uh, you are able to raise your hand with a button on the uh, toolbox. There should be a button uh, maybe it's a round button with a hand, and if you press that button, it'll notify me, and then we will unmute your microphone, and you can engage in some back and forth dialogue with Mike Bugovitz or myself. If you don't want to hear the sound of your own voice, you're welcome to just type your question in the chat box or the question box. So we're very lucky today to have Mike Bukovitz with us again uh, for yet another installment in our arc flash and arc flash mitigation series um, and today mike is going to explain the uh, easy and quick and inexpensive process of extending the what, what i will call the zone of protection outside of the switch gear that contains the arc quencher and down into things like MCCs, medium voltage drives, et cetera. So now I'll turn it over to Mike Bukovitz. Well, good afternoon. And uh, as always, uh, it's a privilege uh, to be with you uh, here today. Uh, I want you to know I appreciate each and every uh, one of you who's uh, chosen to spend your valuable uh, time uh, in this webinar today. Um, to begin with, I'd like to say that as well, I very much appreciate uh, questions um, during the presentation and we'll have time for that after the presentation as well. Um, if you are thinking of a question or there's something I haven't uh, covered uh, in a complete manner, uh, that leaves you wondering, um, please have the courage to um, hit that little hand up uh, button and um, ask, the, ask the question, because if you're thinking it, it's very likely others on the webinar are thinking uh, the same question. Uh, Michael McClellan uh, will field those questions and um, I'll do my best to answer them. And if I, if I don't have an answer to the question, uh, we'll be sure to get you uh, an answer in writing after the conclusion uh, of the webinar. Uh, I know many of you have been to some of my presentations previous. Uh, for any of the first time attenders, very briefly, 
I've worked in and around exposed energized assets for more than 40 years. Uh, I've worked in well more than 60 countries on both power and automation uh, projects. And uh, but the, a good portion in charting the course of my career has been in electrical safety. Uh, one of my uh, close friends was killed in an arc flash accident in August of 2001. And as a result of those events, I became convinced that I was myself um, working in a, a patently unsafe and selfish manner um, because uh, none of us are an island. Um, anyone gets hurt, anyone is at the hospital or dead, it affects everyone around you, your family, your coworkers, your neighbors. Um, so the, the, um, the passion that you see today is very real. Um, but the, the technical questions that need, there are still technical questions that need to be answered, and I do look forward to those. Um, this is a slide um, that is in every single one of my presentations, and uh, I open this by saying this is not a presentation uh, on ArcFlash. Um, we do offer uh, separate webinars strictly on arc flash risk and uh, arc flash hazards, and most importantly, compliance with NFPA 70E, uh, the standard for electrical safety uh, in the workplace. Uh, but it, as the, so this is the only slide you will see in the presentation on arc flash. Um, the fact that at um, three times hotter than the surface of the sun, uh, up to 30,000 degrees Fahrenheit, copper or steel are vaporized, turned into a plasma gas and propelled it up to 200 miles an hour. It's deafening. The high lux intensity is sufficient to score the cornea of a human eye. Uh, and the explosive pressure, um, once the arc flash incident energy exceeds 40 calories per centimeter squared within the arc flash hazard boundary, uh, is sufficient to collapse eardrums and collapse lungs. Um, the average cost is more than half a million dollars, but I have been involved um, as an expert witness in, in suits that are tens of millions of dollars. And there are five to 10 of these incidents uh, per day. Um, I should add that uh, NFPA 70E is referenced in 100% of all litigation I've been associated with, associated with electrical accidents. Uh, so without further ado, and some of these slides you'll see from previous presentations, but this is predominantly a new presentation today. Um, so I encourage you, um, because th I would consider this an advanced presentation. So jumping into this presentation before you've seen our complete Art Quencher presentation, which you can see on the L link to on the LC website, might be confusing to you because we don't go deep into arc quenching technology um, in this presentation. We're here to, to focus on IEEE C37.20.7 compliance, particularly as it applies to variable frequency drives. <laughs> we have um, given webinars in the past, which you can also link on, uh, on incorporating arc quenching devices, turning turning equipment to be arc resistant. But, and when I, whenever I say arc resistant, I mean compliant with IEEE C37.20.7. And we've done that for switchgear and transformers. So some examples in the past that we've, in past webinars we've shown are um, uh, arc quenchers in medium voltage switchgear, both metal clad and metal enclosed, and low voltage equipment, um, both uh, UL1558 and UL891 switchboards, um, and incorporated are, it's actually in new installations, our favorite place to position an arc quencher, um, which is in the secondary ATC of either a liquid filled or dry type transformer. Um, but this presentation today um, is going to focus on motor control centers and variable frequency drives. And I have to tell you, these are the two assets that the majority of our customers that I've been working with over the past 10 years are interested in protecting. And why is that? And that it is because these are the two assets and you can add panel boards and control panels to that list, but MCCs and variable frequency drives are the majority of the concern here uh, in terms of arc flash risk, is these are the two assets that qualified persons are most commonly working on in an exposed, energized manner for testing, 
troubleshooting and calibration. Those three tasks, which fall under the diagnostic work definition of NFPA 70E. So the, um, the arc quencher and um, in many cases is installed above these assets. And once you've made that investment in the arc quencher, extending these arc resistant benefits okay, to downstream drives okay, and motor control centers and control panels and panel boards is uh, relatively inexpensive. And by relatively inexpensive, what I mean is the, the installation labor uh, to extend the sensors and 18-gauge um, belt and wires to these devices is frequently less than the is frequently more than the, the cost of the equipment. So it's it's a, a very economical solution once you've made the initial investment in an arc quencher to extend those benefits to these um, mission critical downstream assets. So this is a picture of a Rockwell centerline. Uh, motor control center. It was constructed by Rockwell, not arc resistant. So this is a standard uh, RA um, centerline series 2100 motor control center. This, this particular MCC is in a wastewater treatment plant that was specified C37.20.7, but you can see there's no plenums up on top. There's no mechanical venting here whatsoever. And uh, the reason for that is if you look at the red boxes I've just highlighted, um, that arc that we we've had arc sensor uh, installed, both fiber light sensors and point light sensors. Um, those tied in tie into the a sensor relay because we don't want to wire all these sensors back individually, okay, to the upstream arc quencher and an enunciation panel. And if you look closely there, you can see that the the blue LED is illuminated. Um, indicating that the arc quencher system is active and working properly. Um, the system, being a life safety system, um, runs multiple diagnostics um, uh, per second on every single relay and sensor uh, in the system. So by adding, uh, by extending this arc, th this uh, these sensors into the MCC, this motor control center becomes compliant with IEEE C37.20.7. Um, it becomes arc resistant and is labeled as such. So when we look at an existing insulation, and this was an existing insulation that was subsequently converted. So this is a, a again, a standard non-arc resistant Rockwell low voltage motor control center, you know, or a variable. And you can see in that MCC right in the middle, there's a couple of variable frequency drives sitting there as well inside the motor control center. Um, how do we make VFDs and MCCs arc resistant? Well, if we, in this example, start with a transformer, as previously shown, that has an arc quencher system integrated into the secondary ATC. And why do we like that so much? We like it so much because it allows us to protect a larger portion of the system. The closer we get to the unprotected secondary bus of the transformer with both the current transformers that we need to, to sense the current and the arc quencher device itself, the more the system we're able to protect. Because by the time we reach the switch gear then, that whole, and that is a UL891, that's a, uh, if you're familiar with what it looks like, that's a, happens to be a square D QED2 UL891 switchboard lineup. That entire switchboard lineup, and look at all the vents up the front uh, that you would have, definitely not arc resistant prior to implementation of this system, but now with the arc quenchers installed, that equipment also becomes arc resistant. And that switchboard in this example is feeding variable frequency drives, motor control centers, and panel boards, all with light sensors installed. Everything you see here um, from the switchboards, including the VFDs, MCCs, and panel boards, all then becomes arc resistant. There is a picture of the uh, point light sensors, uh, both uh, assembled and uh, with the covers removed so you could see the, the wiring that takes place. Um, 
The particular system that we highlight here today accepts both point light sensors and fiber light sensors. And it's quite common for us to use both types of sensors in the same installation. Uh, the wire you're looking at is a common Belden uh, 18 gauge uh, wire. So this is a typical single line diagram um, from one of our um, water projects that we did uh, recently. And on this project, it was specified that the, the motor control centers, um, which you, and you see that there's one, only one big MCC in this project. In the upper right-hand corner there would be arc resistant along with the transfer switch. Um, and uh, the downstream variable frequency drives would be uh, arc resistant as well. So here we can see in the upper left-hand corner, that is the utility uh, service entrance equipment. Uh, the utility in this case did allow uh, for high resistance grounding. Okay? So even though it was a YY transformer, they broke the bond between HO and XO and the bond between XO and ground. And since they floated the Y, it's essentially the equivalent of a delta other than the phase shift. So that would allow for high resistance grounding. Uh, we do highly recommend high resistance grounding, um, whether you have an arc quencher or not, um, because uh, although high resistance grounding does not reduce arc flash incident energy, it reduces the risk, the probability of an arc flash event occurring by at least 95%, according to IEEE. And what that means in real world terms in this arc quencher application is that the odds, the, the, the risk that the arc quencher will ever need to operate, in fact, is reduced by 95%. So here we see the motor control center labeled MCC1. Okay. Here we see the arc quencher and the arc quencher uh, controls uh, installed inside the motor control center. Here I've uh, put dashed lines over the PLS or point light sensors that are installed in this uh, motor control center. Now again, we could have used as well fiber light sensors. Um, fiber light sensors though do have a weakness. They don't, su they don't easily support shipping splits. Whereas the point light sensor which is electrically connected, uh, easily terminates the terminal blocks um, and supports shipping splits so that we don't have to install the fiber light sensors at the job site. Downstream being fed from this motor control center, we see three standalone variable frequency drives um, in, a motor, in a motor control panel. And in, uh, inside those drives, if you look at the bottom and the top, you'll see uh, there's two point light sensors in each of the drive cabinets. In addition to that, there is an arc quencher annunciation panel, the same one you saw earlier in the picture. Uh, so before you go into any piece of equipment without arc rated PPE on, because in the case of arc quenchers, as if you've seen the previous arc quencher presentation, we always eliminate the NFPA 70E requirement for arc rated PPE. Uh, specifically, that means we always reduce the in incident energy below 1.2 calories per centimeter squared at the IEEE 1584 working distance, which for these low voltage assets would be 18 inches. So here is a picture of a light sensor installed, okay, in a, a motor control center. I believe this was in a, a soft start bucket. That sensor can be installed uh, also on the other side of the uh, steel barrier there as well. You just drill a hole and put the little nub of the light sensor through it. So that is an example of a surface mount design. There's mounting brackets for angle mounting uh, light sensors as well. There's a, the, um, it, it, it mounting these sensors is simple too for surface mount, just uh, two um, machine screws in, the, in this case. Here's an example of a layout, okay, of a motor control center with variable frequency drives, uh, where we used a combination of both point light sensors and fiber light sensors. Now this was an existing MCC, and there really was no 
physical space whatsoever uh, in this motor control center for the addition of the sensor relays. So there's a picture where you can see we have fiber light, I'm sorry, point light sensors uh, in the red box. The black lines show the routes of the fiber light sensors. And what we did is we mounted a small external cabinet. You can see that on the right side of the drawing there, and I'll highlight it for you, uh, where we put the enunciation panel and the sensor relays since there was no phys physical room inside the MCC. I would say seven times out of 10 with an existing MCC, we're able to find room for that. Um, and that we also have a DIN rail mounted version of the sensor relays, which can be installed in the top or bottom wire troughs um, of the motor control center itself. Um, but the actual placement and of both the point light sensors and the fiber light sensors in this equipment is a result of empirical testing um, that has been done in high power test labs to verify under all arc flash conditions that the light sensors would proper, properly assert. Here is another example of a light sensor installation, um, this time in uh, a, a variable frequency uh, drive and MCC combination. And uh, you can see, again, we, in, in, the, in this case, we had room, since this was a new installation, uh, to install the annunciation panel and the arc flash relays in the MCC. And of course, we don't wanna do that in the bo bottom bucket where you have to get on your knees in order to see it. We prefer to have it at some elevated level. And if not, we'll do what we showed on the previous drawing, which is install a small external control panel uh, for, for installation of the enunciation panels as well as the sensor relays. So in terms of what we can protect, I need to make an important point. Um, only equipment which is short circuit type testing can by definition be made arc resistant. So if the, if the VFD or motor control center okay, is not short circuit type tested, it doesn't have an interrupting or withstand rating. Okay. It cannot be made arc resistant, either by mechanical venting or arc quenching means. Now, of course, all modern MCCs that you would buy um, from any major manufacturer okay, would, have, would be type tested, as would any panel board. So in terms of short circuit type testing, understanding type testing and arc resisting, type testing is, is focused okay, on maintaining enclosure integrity. And its emphasis is not on, on protecting the equipment itself. It's not about equipment survival. It's about safety. No doors or panels may, may break open. Now, equipment that is type tested, whether it's switch gear, a VFD, um, a motor control center, um, if it's type tested, that doesn't mean the internal components survive an arc flash event. Again, the arc flash event without an arc quencher at 30,000 degrees Fahrenheit right, is going to vaporize most materials that you would find inside that equipment. And the purpose, as we'll see in mechanical venting, is to vent that out of um, plenums out the top of the gear right, and safely expel it so it isn't expelled out the front of the gear and it hurts people. And, and causes injuries. So hot gas and plasma in standard equipment may be expelled from vents and seams in the enclosure, and it still passes type testing. Okay? But again, no, no doors or panels may be, break open. In other words, the enclosure may not rupture. If the enclosure ruptures, it fails type testing. It would have to be redesigned by the manufacturer. Okay? So the focus here is on safety, and not on equipment survivability, but we must have a short circuit type test okay, in order to convert the equipment then with an arc quencher to be arc resistant. Um, arc resistant equipment compliant with C37.20.7 is also, I wanna be clear about this, focused on safety. Not the, the, the C37.20.7, okay? It's not about the survivability of the equipment itself. 
Okay. Type one uh, protection under C37.20.7 protects you from the front of the equipment and type two from the front side and rear of the equipment. And all of the major manufacturers I'm aware of, I'm sure there are exceptions out there, produce type two equipment when they produce an arc resistant design. And all arc resistant equipment, again, by definition, uh, is type tested. But of course, not all type tested equipment meets C37.20.7. So when we compare type tested equipment to arc resistant, so on the left, I have a square D switchboard, which is just a standard non-arc resistant switchboard. And how can you tell that? Well, look at all the vents on the front okay, that could vent hot gas and plasma um, out the front of that switchboard. Now, again, none of the covers and the enclosure itself cannot rupture, but it could definitely eject hot gas and plasma. On the right, we have an example uh, provided by Eaton Corporation in the picture that shows type tested and arc resistant. Okay, so notice no vents out the, out the front of the equipment. The vents in this case are on those plenums at the top of the gear, which are typically extended to ex exhaust plenums out the roof or side of a building where, it can, where the exhaust plasma cannot harm anybody. But I want to be clear, in the event of an arc flash event, in either of these pieces of equipment, the one on the left or the one on the right, the equipment its side, if it's mechanically, it's a, if, if it was, it's a mechan it, even if it's mechanically vented, like the one on the right, the equipment its side can and frequently is catastrophically damaged beyond the ability for practical um, or economic field repair. So this is a picture. Um, this is actually one of um, uh, uh, Mr. McClellan's panels with Power Plus controls. Um, was um, built just um, within the last 60 days. Uh, so the NEMA starters in this control panel, the individual motor starter branch circuits are series rated up to 100 kA. Uh, so there is, a, there is a short circuit rating on the components themselves. Okay. So the question is, why isn't this control panel considered type tested? Okay. And the answer is, it's not about just the component rating inside. It's about the enclosure. If an arc flash event was initiated at either of the points I'm showing here, okay, th there is no guarantee that this enclosure door would remain closed. Okay. The only way I could verify that will remain closed and not break open is to take it to a high power test lab and test it for whatever amount of fault current I want to rate it to and verify it maintains enclosure integrity. So what about a really old Frankenstein era switchboard like this? Type tested, arc resistant? And the answer is, um, believe it or not, the switchboard was type tested in its day, very different standards back then. But the bottom line is under internal short circuit events, it maintained enclosure integrity. None of those panels, which in this case you can see are bolted closed on both sides will break open. But it's clearly not arc resistant because we have energized exposed assets on the front of the old style switchboard. So when we look at C37.20.7, what is it? It's, it's, uh, the standard is ultimately there to define test procedures and test criteria, the outcome of tests, which define what can be then classified, what we call arc resistant. Now, it was originally written for metal enclosed switch gear, but it has subsequently been applied across industry on all types of equipment, switchboards, low voltage and medium voltage equipment uh, together uh, with switch gear, motor control centers, variable frequency drive cabinets, panel boards, and, all, and many other, type, many other uh, types of type tested equipment. Um, so the, once you follow the test standard, that definition uh, in C37.20.7 has been applied. And the most important point, one of the most important points I wanna make in this entire presentation is the final point at the bottom of this slide. Okay? So C37.20.7, 
okay, allows the use of equivalent volume dummy devices rather than actual circuit breakers and other major components. Therefore, the actual arc resistant enclosure being tested is independent of the interior uh, components. Going back to my earlier point, this is about maintaining enclosure integrity and not allowing hot gas and plasma to be ejected from vents and seams or failures of the enclosure itself, whether it's a bolted panel or a hinge panel breaking open. So the introduction section, so this is right at the beginning of C37.20.7 says, when, an arc, when arc resistant construction is specified, it's strongly recommended that supplemental power protection be provided. Let's be clear here, okay, what is this saying? It's saying even when you have you know, um, arc resistant construction, okay, supplemental um, power system protection is, re is, is recommended. This supplemental protection should limit the total energy that can be delivered in the event of eternal arcing fault. So they're saying in this case, and I believe this statement when it was written, okay, this is my impression of C37.20.7, I'm giving you a singular interpretation here, was written with arc venting, mechanical venting in mind. Because what they're saying is that they know when they with mechanical venting, it doesn't reduce incident energy at all. So they're recommending to reduce incident energy, even when you have mechanical venting, that additional arc flash mitigation be applied. With respect to the National Electric Code, uh, um, the code does not require, I want to be clear, arc resistant equipment. Uh, the only reference um, in, in the entire NEC is in Article 100. Under when it's defining what switch gear is. And the, the last sentence is just an informational note, and it says both non-arc resistant and arc resistant construction is available. And, and it says that this type of switch gear is used to enhance safety for equipment of operators and maintenance uh, personnel. Uh, but again, consistent definition here, even within NFPA 70, the National Electric Code, the design criteria here is on safety, not equipment reliability, or the ability to return the electrical system to normal operation uh, after an arc flash event. And I should note in one of the depositions uh, that I have given that they it was brought up, okay, by um, the, the, the defense side in an arc flash event that NFPA 70 does not require arc resistant equipment. It doesn't. Uh, you can, but it was, you have to remember when these things end up in litigation, you're not talking to engineers and technical professionals. Uh, and the, the point brought up by plaintiff's attorney is so arc resistant equipment is available, but you still chose non arc resistant. They said, that's right. He said, why did you do that? And he said, well, it's not required by the code. He said, it's not required, but why did you choose non-ARC resistant? And I mentioned this only to give you a non-technical person's, in this case, an attorney's perspective, okay, on the, on the two decisions. And the response given was, because it's not required and non-ARC resistant equipment is less expensive. Okay? It wasn't long after that before I was dismissed because they were going to settle. Uh, these things rarely, rarely end up in front of a jury. So with respect to arc resistant equipment, and many of you have seen this slide from one of my previous presentations, there are two choices and two choices alone for IEEE C37.20.7 compliance. Uh, the first is mechanical venting. Uh, we're gonna build a very robust uh, structure and closure, and then we're going to redirect or vent the arc flash plasma out the top of the gear and attach plenums frequently to that. So out the roof of the building or side of the building where it's not gonna hurt anybody. Uh, the second option uh, and the one uh, promoted by L3 and my own company and uh, a central purpose of my presentation is uh, arc quenching. And I'll be, be up front. I believe in every um, measurement of the two technologies, arc quenching uh, obsoletes um, and is a superior technology to a mechanical venting solution uh, for arc resistant compliance. So the mechanical venting, uh, the, 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 the very definition is we're gonna take the energy 
uh, exhausted out through to a location away from equipment operators. Um, and this approach to our equipment design usually, not always, but usually uses vent flaps that open under the pressure of the fault and redirect the superheated gases uh, away from any personnel. So again, the, the focus is on safety, but the equipment itself frequently gives its life in the, in the performance of its duty. So with respect, if you're considering mechanically vented solutions to C37.20.7 is to ask yourself, because um, arc resistant sounds good, sounds better than non-arc resistant, uh, knowing the dangers of arc flash events, to ask yourself if, if it's a good idea or just a good sounding bad idea. So here's uh, some typical this is 15 kV metal clad switch gear manufactured by Siemens. This is installed in a wastewater plant. Uh, the um, very robust construction, look at all the, the bolts, okay, on each of those panels. Okay? The circuit breaker door you see at the bottom here weighs approximately 400 pounds. Okay? So extremely robust. I call it the Abrams tank approach to um, building switch gear. Uh, we're going to be we're going to be able to contain that arc flash incident energy and vent it out the top with these exhaust plenums that you see here. And in this case, since they couldn't bring it out the roof, they exhausted it out the side of the building because there there were offices up above uh, the area. They exhausted it out the side of the building and built a fence around the area. Um, so of course, no one would put a picnic bench there or station themselves uh, adjacent to an arc flash exhaust plenum. Here's a picture of mechanically vented arc resistant variable frequency uh, drives. This particular drive lineup is an Eaton solution. And you can see again, the exhaust plenums, okay, on top of the equipment. So in terms of arc venting disadvantages here, um, I call it, you know, there's this, the seven deadly sins, you know, less than v, envy, slothful, uh, the, the, these are the seven deadly sins of mechanical arc venting. Um, one is it doesn't reduce arc flash instant energy compared to standard switch gear, not at all. It just redirects it. Two, it only redirects arc energy when it's properly enclosed and, and closed up. So the second you open one of those panels, if it's exposed to energize, it's no longer arc resistant. And in fact, you have greatly enhanced risk at that point because the arc energy is now directed toward the person standing in front of the open panel. Uh, just as electricity follows all paths, but favors low impedance paths, in an arc flash event, the plasma favors low air pressure paths. So if you open a panel, on arc resistant mechanically vented gear, the arc flash event, if it does occur, is coming right to you. Number three, you cannot extend any arc resistant benefits to downstream equipment, which is the subject of this presentation. Um, we're trying to extend those benefits. We intend to extend those benefits to drives and motor control centers and panel boards and uh, other type tested equipment. It does not ensure equipment reliability or rapid return to service. Again, the, the focus is strictly on person not venting out the front, back, rear, uh, or in low voltage compartments in the equipment. Um, so it is, it, it's it, the equipment itself, if you're in a critical power environment, it's gonna ensure long downtime, uh, even if it can be somehow repaired. Um, it, it has poor maintainability in electrical mission critical environments. Downstream MCCs and variable frequency drives and control panels now have the same arc flash incident energy as standard non-arc rated equipment, unless you buy a separate arc, you know, a resistant mechanically vented MCC or drive. It's not retrofittable. Um, arc, mechanical arc venting is only avail available in new equipment installations. And the seventh sin, um, it is expensive to, to purchase, install, and maintain. So from an electrical design conclusion, and I realize this is a subjective analysis here, but for, in terms of electrical safety, in terms of reliability, and from a maintainability expect, perspective, mechanically vented solutions to C37.20.7, it's just, it's a bad idea. Um, you can do it. It's allowed. 
that's allowed by the National Electric Code, but compared to the alternative technology, which is available, um, it is a suboptimal design. So if mechanically vented solutions for C37.27 are, as I've stated in the previous slide, a bad idea, meaning specifically a poor design choice, um, why is arc flash mechanical redirection, why is it so popular out there? Because there's a lot of it out there being sold every day still. And one is it was invented first. So in the early 2000s, when we, we began to quantify the risks via IEEE 1584 mathematics of arc flash events. Um, the first solution was mechanical venting. Yeah. It was simpler to implement and it, it, it was there first and it remains popular because of that. And it also sounds good to non-technical people uh, because arc resistant, as I noted in the previous deposition that I was involved in, sounds much better than non-arc resistant. So talk to any safety manager at the IEEE Safety Show that's non-electrical, uh, and they, they will tell you arc-resistant equipments. It, you give them the choice between the two, they always pick arc-resistant. The USA, I mean, where we live, is it's the most litigious society in the world. There are 10 attorneys for every engineer in our society, which is the exact opposite of Japan, where there's 10 engineers for every attorney. Um, so um, litigation, negative publicity are have to be high priorities for the business. And that even amongst electrical power system engineers, um, I believe our quenching is still often an unknown option. Even though it's noted in NFPA 70E, our quenching is defined in NFPA 70E and Annex O, okay? Um, it's, it's still, even though it's approved by the National Electric Code and NEC 240.87, it is still often um, not a well-known or it's viewed as new technology or, or it's just misunderstood. Um, the definition of arc quenching out of NFPA 70E is that a system that reduces the arcing duration by creating a low impedance current path within a controlled compartment that causes the arcing fault to transfer to a new current path. And this always works by without compromising the, the existing electrical uh, coordination, the selective coordination of the overcurrent protection devices. Um, our particular system is nothing more than a very powerful electrically withstand rated electromagnet, which is resettable like a circuit breaker. So these are some arc quencher device examples. Um, the, our devices shown on the left are resettable devices, resettable just like a circuit breaker. Uh, and here there are some examples on the right, both low voltage and medium voltage for non-resettable. Uh, uh, solutions. So uh, the Eaton device shown is a one-time use device. The ABB device is quite unique. Uh, the UFIS, the ultra-fast earthing switch, it's uh, a set, I call it automotive airbag technology. It's a one-time chemical discharge out of those canisters. Those canisters that look like insulators are the actual um, shorting devices. So how does an arc quencher work? It detects the, the through the uh, protective relay. If it sees more in, our, in, in most of our designs, more than 50,000 lux of light, at the same time it sees a rapid change in current with respect to time, okay? it asserts the arc quencher from arc flash initiation to complete extinguishing of the arc in a low voltage environment is less than four milliseconds and less than five milliseconds in a medium voltage environment. And this not only provides safety, it prevents catastrophic damage to the equipment. In terms of the standards, um, arc quencher devices are defined by UL and listed by UL under UL 2748. I believe at present we have the only resettable solution uh, that's UL 2748 uh, listed. The equivalent international standard is uh, 609.47.91. Um, our device is dual rated. So we are both UL listed okay, and we carry the IEC rating as well for international application. Uh, it's compliant with NEC 240.87 and NFPA 70E Annex O, all of the above. So when we look at a piece of type tested equipment, like again, these uh, Danfoss drives, all right? standard standalone uh, VFDs that are could be already installed. We take an arc quencher system, 
we add that arc quencher system to the standard normal non-arc resistant equipment and we achieve C37.20.7 compliance. But again, there's a caveat here, those drives must be type tested in order for us to achieve that. So a typical arc quenching system that we have here, we're gonna take uh, our, our CTs and light sensors, connect them to a protective relay, uh, attach that to an arc uh, a quenching device. The connection between those two, by the way, is via a fiber optic cable. Uh, we include an enunciation system uh, that's typically attached as well. There's a controller that's part of this that attaches to a plant SCADA system, and that creates the complete arc quenching system. So this is a, for any of you who have been to my presentation before, I, again, like the initial slide, I always like to show this because it shows the difference between standard type tested equipment and type tested equipment with an arc quencher. This is a 65,000 amp test at 480 volts and a UL891 listed switch board. The switch board on the left has an arc quencher installed. It has a quenching time of four milliseconds. The switch board on the right uh, does not have an arc quencher installed, uh, but again, it is type tested. So I'm beginning the video now. If you look very carefully at the, the switchboard on the left, you should see a brief flash of light right there. And on the right at the 50 millisecond mark, I have no problem seeing what occurs to the switchboard on the right. So both of these switchboards pass type testing, uh, to be clear. Um, but the switchboard on the left with the arc quencher, this is what the bus looked like. There's a little bit of scoring. That switchboard required approximately 20 minutes of maintenance uh, to clean up the uh, tracking on the bus, uh, retest the equipment, and return it to service. And its service was to, because I can only afford one switchboard, uh, to perform the test on the right. Um, without the arc quencher, we've vaporized more than 32 pounds of copper in this event. So the switchboard on the right was damaged um, beyond the ability for practical field repair. So summarizing mechanical venting versus arc quenching in terms of safety. Mechanical venting um, is only arc resistant when the equipment is properly closed and not exposed energized. Okay? Whereas with arc quenching, it's arc resistant whether the equipment enclosure is open or enclosed. And uh, the picture there shows, uh, again, that was a large Rockwell VFD lineup uh, that we protected um, with our arc quenching system. In terms of safety, again, from a personnel point of view, um, it, when with arc resistant equipment, the PPE level is what it is. Uh, so the, the requirement for percent PPE is not reduced. Whereas you see here, uh, this was an, you can tell the screen is energized areas working on this is an exposed energized equipment, um, but no arc rated PPE uh, required by NFPA 70E, of course, when whenever the arc quenching system is applied. In terms of reliability, um, downstream assets with um, mechanical venting are still non-arc resistant. Whereas with arc quenching, um, any asset with the light sensors installed, and the light sensors are inexpensive. Uh, they're, you know, it's less than $120 for a light sensor. Uh, and each light sensor can protect up to two square meters of volume in a typical application. Um, we can protect variable frequency drives, motor control centers, panel boards, and disconnects. So when we compare the two, mechanical venting only protects when the equipment is closed, arc quenching when it's open or closed. Mechanical venting only provides safety, whereas arc quenching provides safety and reliability. Mechanical venting may be, the equipment may be catastrophically damaged during the arc flash event, whereas arc quenching, we protect the equipment itself. Uh, there is no reduction in arc flash incident energy with mechanical venting, whereas arc quenching always reduces the incident energy below the critical 1.2 calorie per centimeter squared level. Uh, that level on the stoll curve above which um, would, could ca will cause a third degree burn or permanently debilitating injuries. Uh, mechanical venting does not lower PPE requirements, whereas arc rated PPE is eliminated with arc quenching. 
Um, you cannot extend the ARC resistant protection to downstream assets, which is the subject of this presentation. And any downstream asset, which is type tested and applied with light sensors becomes ARC resistant uh, per C37.20.7. And uh, mechanical venting is expensive to install, requires additional hardware such as exhaust plenums, whereas uh, arc quenching installs inside standard equipment such as switchgear or transformers. And uh, mechanical venting is a new equipment only, whereas arc uh, quenching is a new retrofit or retrofill situations. The three questions we always ask in arc quenching is how important is uptime? Um, and what are your goals for arc, reducing arc flash hazards? If the goal is only to reduce it to eight calories or four calories, I wanna be clear, we can get there almost always without an arc quencher. Um, but the equipment itself will likely not survive the event. Uh, that's when you're focused on safety only. And number three, uh, with the benefit, what's the benefit of eliminating the need for arc rated PPE? Uh, people always ask uh, if I don't mention it, you know, in terms of budgetary cost for arc quenching. And what we give people for low voltage systems is $75,000 and add another $10,000 for medium voltage systems. Um, it, again, it's like asking how much does switchgear cost. It's like it's nice to have some criteria, but it, for for budgetary numbers, um, that should generally get you you will generally be very safe uh, using those numbers when budgeting arc quencher systems, and that includes the hardware, the software, the drawings, the design, the project management, factory acceptance testing, a delivered system working for the application out of the factory, everything except the site acceptance testing. And that concludes my presentation uh, for today. Um, I look forward to any uh, questions. And again, it's always a privilege um, to be here on these L3 webinars. I need to give credit to Mr. McClellan. He comes up with all these ideas for these topics and um, how to present them. And um, I'm, I'm grateful uh, to be here with you this afternoon. I look forward to your questions. Well, thanks, Mike. It's uh, it's easy to come up with the ideas. <laughs> it's much harder to present. So thank you for agreeing to present. Uh, I've got several questions that came in, but before I start on those does anybody want to raise their hand and engage in some verbal dialogue back and forth with mike okay first question that came in was how many point light sensors need to go into a mcc section um all depends on the size of the mcc section so uh on um, an individual, you know, an MCC has um, in the United in North America 72 inches of vertical mounting space. So if you had size one buckets, you'd have six starters there. Um, if you were using point light sensors, you would need one point light sensor for every single one of those starter buckets. Uh, so every light sensor can protect up to two cubic square meters of volume but the buckets are isolated from one another. So I have to tell you, you know, motor control centers without question are the most challenging to apply light sensors to because of their highly compartmentalized nature. And this is why if you saw in the um, earlier picture that I had um, that we frequently use uh, fiber light sensors. Now, again, um, sometimes I shy away from fiber light sensors because they don't support shipping splits. Um, and quite frankly, they're less robust. So, you know, it's, it, whether you're using glass or plastic fiber, and we have both, um, th th there is just a, um, there's a greater propensity for damage with the fiber light sensor. So I have over time, uh, even though we use both, subscribe to the point light sensors. But for economic reasons, okay, you can see here, we avoided a lot of point light sensors in this out in this picture you see right here by running the fiber. And in a motor control center, uh, the, the way we run the fiber is to the left side of the buckets, not in the, the we, we have a separate sensor in the wire way, but to protect the buckets, we, we have to remove all the buckets from the motor control center. And there's typically 
uh, a small space, it's only about a quarter inch, between the left side of the bucket and the left side wall of the MCC. And that's where we run these fiber optic uh, cables. We can have up to 30 meter loops. So we, you know, we get up there, you know, approximately 90 feet, you know, per channel. Um, that go and and each of those uh, sensor relays can support four channels, so we could have four 90-foot loops, um, which is plenty to cover even the the largest motor control centers uh, that we've that 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 I've personally encountered. Great question. Uh, it looks like Roger Brown had a question. Roger, you're unmuted. Can you hear me? Yeah. I can hear you perfect, Roger. Oh, I wanted to know if you could share your PowerPoints with us. I like your presentation. Thank you very much. A absolutely. So I want to be clear at the end of every uh, presentation, um, I give a co I send the, the copy of the presentation to Mr. McClellan. Um, so whether it's via Michael McClellan or your local um, L3 representative, um, is is happy to forward you a, a copy of the presentation for um, for for you to review at your leisure. And um, we you know, we we could, again we consider it a privilege and an honor when people ask us for copies of things. And by the way, in addition to presentation, if you're doing projects, we have AutoCAD drawings we can give you to start your projects, um, guide form specifications, um, whatever you need. Uh, to help move you from where you are now to successful implementation of art quenchers. There are a variety of materials that are available. And that, of course, includes the standard user manuals. Uh, we have a separate video on YouTube on how to incorporate art quenchers into power system studies uh, using SKM, ETAP, or Easy Power. Um, so it's just a there's a plethora of support materials, but um, yeah, the, the, a copy of the presentation is one of the easiest things we do. So thank you for asking. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, Roger. Next question that came in in the video, you showed quite a bit of smoke coming out of the switchboard that passed the test. What mm -hmm. elements are contained in this smoke and is it harmful or toxic to a human being? Yeah, it absolutely can be. Uh, to, if, if you're caught in the plasma and you inhale uh, that, so those particles, you know, we're, we're talking um, copper that's been vaporized. Okay, so it, it, it forms at that point an energized plasma and it is propelled at up to 200 miles an hour. So this is far faster than any human being can react. Um, now, I'm not gonna kid you, the greatest threat that you face in an arc flash event is to your face and neck, your, there's this torso, down to your torso area, but any arc flash damage um, to your face, uh, it, which is why we define working distance Okay, that 18 inch distance we define as the minimum distance between an exposed energized asset and your face and torso. Um, so it, it, and it, installing the arc quencher, by the way, okay, does not relieve you of any responsibility uh, for following the safe electrical work practices of NFPA 70E. And one of those safe work practices is keeping your face and torso at all times, at least 18 inches away from exposed energized assets, because that's the distance at which we calculated the arc flash incident energy. So great question. And um, yeah, if you're standing in front of that type tested equipment and you and you you are hit with that hot gas and plasma, it can not only burn you, but if you inhale it, it can and will do permanent damage to your to your respiratory system. Um, so the, the the quotation we use in our literature is permanently debilitating injuries up to and including death. Great question. Okay, great. We have another question. Um, Malu Gita, you are unmuted. I'm not hearing anything, Michael. 
Michael? Okay. Oh, it also came in uh, written. Is it possible Hello? to... Oh, there she is. Okay. She had to unmute. Okay. We had to unmute. Okay. It is uh, possible to monitor remotely uh, for our quenching medium. Remotely, you can monitor through clouds, cloud system. Okay. Help yeah, me out, what Michael. What you saying, Mike, is um, is it possible to monitor the status of the arc quencher, um, whether you've had an event? Um, is it possible to monitor this remotely? It, yeah, not only possible, but 95% of our applications have that. So um, the controller system that we have uh, is capable because we, we can put in any bus communication device in there uh, to communicating to any plant SCADA system. So uh, Ethernet IP, the Rockwell protocol, uh, Modbus TCP, uh, Profibus, um, straight Ethernet, I mean, um, w whatever digital medium um, the customer has, we guarantee that we can talk, you know, we have the capability um, and the integration experience to talk to that digital medium. So um, although there is local enunciation, of course, uh, and there's, there's, a, there's an HMI uh, panel, diagnostic panel, that's on the front of the equipment and the, and the arc quencher control panel. So there's always local enunciation, but um, any well-designed system is also connected to the existing plant or facility SCADA system. And that can be done either through hard contact, so we have relay contact outputs, but is done most frequently um, through the digital communication capabilities of the system. Great question. Thank you. Okay, next question that came in. Uh, I have a switchboard with only molded case UL489 breakers. Mm -hmm. As I understand it, these breakers have an interrupting rating, but not a short time rating. Can I install point light sensors into this switchboard and extend the protected zone into my switchboard? Okay, so as long as the arc quencher unit is upstream of the switchboard, okay, um, when you extend um, the light sensors into the switchboard, the switchboard will become arc resistant. Okay? Now, remember that arc, the arc quencher must have a device uh, on the line side above it, which is trippable. All right? So, but provided that uh, the switchboard is, uh, as I showed in uh, the, the, um, the, pic, the earlier picture here, hold on a second, let me get to it. Oop. The, the as long as the switchboard is extended uh, to, right here, this is what I'm looking for. As long as it, that switchboard is like the switchboard here, um, those are UL49 breakers. I can tell that's an I-line, square D I-line stack, exactly what you described. Um, so as long as we have a, you know, uh, an arc quencher protecting that system, as soon as I extend my light sensors into that switchboard back to the arc quencher system, um, that switchboard becomes arc resistant. And it doesn't matter to me what the protective functions are on the circuit breakers within that switchboard. Yeah? Whether you're LI or LSI, uh, LSIG, doesn't matter to me. It doesn't matter to me at all in terms of the arc quencher protection. So great question. We're getting some feedback, Michael. Okay, uh, next question that came in. Does Tech 4 produce calculations and documentation showing that this switchboard that contains the newly installed light sensors and arc flash relays is now PPE less than one and is guaranteed AFIE less than 1.2 calories per centimeter squared? Okay. And the answer is yes. When, a, when properly applied and ins installed. So the arc quencher does have a maximum withstand rating, which is 100 kA, 100,000 amps, okay, for the low voltage quencher. Okay? For the medium voltage quencher, it's 50,000 amps. So those are the 
That, that's the maximum cult fault in current environment into which it may be applied. Okay? So when applied within, okay, that withstand rating, when properly applied and installed, we absolutely provide documentation and a guarantee, okay, that the downstream equipment, okay, will be less than uh, 1.2 calories per centimeter squared and therefore arc, arc resistant. Great question. Okay. That's part of, what, question. part of what we do is maintain the integrity of the UL label and um, and provide you know a C37.20.7 solution. That is that is what we're selling with an arc quencher solution. Yeah. Okay. Um, next question is you mentioned point light sensors. Don't you have to add CTs? Oh, a a absolutely. So um, if if CTs are not there, let me go back to my. Um, all right, where I showed the arc quencher system here. It'll take me a second here. Um, yeah, it, we not only, it, the CTs though, I don't need CTs in the downstream equipment. The CTs are already in the upstream equipment with the arc quencher. I do not need to add CTs in the motor control center or the drive cabinet. If there is a fault event in the downstream device, it's the, it's what I like about electricity. It travels just shy of the, uh, just shy of the speed, uh, just shy of the speed of light. Uh, so the the CTs, I want to be clear here. When we sh I showed current sensors and lights, current transformers and light sensors, uh, I do not need to add another set of CTs in the drives or the MCCs. I only need CTs up by the quencher, okay, in whatever equipment is feeding that gear. Uh, so the only thing I'm extending in downstream to the MCCs and the drive cabinets uh, are uh, my light sensors. That's all. Okay. I only need I only use I only need one set of CTs for the entire system. Good question. Thank you. This one almost looks like a trivia question. In <laughs> what year was IEC six zero nine four seven dash nine dash one created? Oh man, I don't know. Um and there's just a new version of it now, now too. So I do know someone, uh, Samuel Daw, who's on the working group. Okay, I'm friends with him. Okay, and um, if if you uh, if you're interested in the the equivalent IEC standards and where they're at now, because I know they just came out within the last couple months with a new, a new addition to the IEC standard. Um, and there are differences between the IEC standard, I should note, and UL 2748. For example, the IEC standard defines, okay, that the voltage drop across the, you know, out of, uh, across the arc quencher cannot be more than, out of the arc, cannot be more than 34 volts. Okay? So, for example, the, the Eaton device, which injects a um, purposeful impedance, could not meet the IEC standard, whereas our device, which effectively drops the voltage to zero, uh, between the phases um, meets both standards. So there are differences between the UL and IEC standards. And, you know, a device like ours had to be designed specifically to meet both of those standards. But in terms of the year, I have, I, I'm, I'm thinking it was around 2010 or 11, but I'm guessing here. Um, Michael, if you would take the question, um, I promise if I didn't know the answer, I'll, I'd get him an answer. And I, I will inquire with Samuel Dahl and he'd be happy to provide a uh, reply with the history of the IEC, uh, International Te Electrotechnical Commission standards uh, for arc quenching devices. Okay, that is all the questions that we have. Those are some great questions. Thank you all for your participation. As always, you should receive a certificate of attendance in about an hour. And if you don't, please let us know. And we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Hope everyone has a safe and productive day. Thank you. Thank you.